is it that is dear to the heart of God? And the answer to that question is family. When we look at that Abrahamic covenant, so important because Abraham was called to respond to God, to submit to God, to demonstrate faith in God. And if he did, what would be the outcome? That a great nation would be produced, and through that nation, all the families, all the families of the earth would be blessed. When we look at the scripture, we see powerfully God's love, his concern for the family. We have been studying the book of Colossians chapter 3, and we see that for the first three lessons of this chapter, there's been an emphasis on how believers should bear forth a testimony, the witness, the behavior that we should demonstrate in order that we manifest God's presence in our life that we have that covenantal relationship with him. And it's so appropriately, as we come to the end of this third chapter, Paul makes a shift. Now, if you read some commentators, they will tell you it's an abundant shift, meaning he turns very abruptly, but really not. Because all of these things that he's been telling us, if we do them, you know who's going to be the recipient? The family. Paul wants to see godly families serving together the risen Savior. So take out your Bible and look with me to where we left off last week, the, the epistle to the Colossians in chapter 3. We're going to begin in, in verse 18 and notice that there's an emphasis here throughout this section on the household, all the members of a household. He begins first and foremost with women. And there's a reason for that. Ladies, you are so important in the spiritual condition of your household, for your family. It's not by accident. It's not by chance. It is through the providence of God, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that he begins here with women. And specifically, in this context, he's speaking about wives. Wives and, we'll see in a moment, mothers as well, because he's going to be speaking about parents. But realize something. Now, this is not to put an undue burden upon women. I remember that one time I was asked to speak about the family, and I decided to speak on Proverbs 31. That, that passage where it speaks about the eshet chayil, meaning that virtuous woman. Now, my wife, she didn't like that message. And she didn't like it because she said, you know, you were asked to speak about the family. And you put all the responsibility, all the burden upon the wife, what she should do, what she should do. You said nothing about the husband other than he should praise his wife for doing all of these things. Well, in one sense... That's true, what she said, that everyone, and the scripture is going to show that, everyone in the family has a role to play, a responsibility. But once more, I want to stand by something, and that is the one member of the household that is key, that's probably going to be the one that gets things going, moving spiritually, the one that's going to be investing the most is going to be the wife, the mother, the woman. When we look at the scripture, we see undoubtedly that God emphasizes the spiritual condition of the woman. When he says that they are weaker or fragile, it means that they are more sensitive to the spiritual. And we as husbands need to realize that, and Paul's going to deal with that in a moment. But let's begin, and it's not a controversial statement. Notice what he says in verse 18. He says, Wives, be submissive to one's own husband. Didn't say to men in general, but it says, Wives, to your own husbands, be submissive. Now, what does this submissiveness speak to? It speaks to a position position 
and a purpose. I want to say that again. This submissiveness speaks to a position and a purpose. What is that purpose? Well, when we go back to the book of Genesis, we see that women were created uniquely from the man, not first but after, and we find that they were created to be a helpmate for the man. Now, what does that mean, a helpmate? That God has created, provided, given to a man, a woman, his wife, in order to assist him in the will of God. That's very, very important. So it does not mean, and he doesn't do something here. He does not say obey in this context, meaning whatever your husband says, obey it. That's not what he says. He says, be submissive. And he's speaking about this condition as a wife. We have to read it in context of, of the book of Genesis. Be submissive, participate, be a force, an energy for God's will. Now, why do I say that? Because if you look some time at the book of Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18, it says, For it is not good, and that word good implies God's will. It is not good for man to be alone, meaning this, man can't do God's will alone. So God supplied a helpmate for him. And what she's, what she's being told here, the wife, is be submissive to your own husband, which is fitting or proper in the Lord. Now, what she's being told here is not only this role is appropriate or proper in the Lord, but I think we need to read it perhaps in a different way. And that is she's submissive to those things that are fitting appropriate in the Lord. Meaning this, if a man says to his wife to do something that is outside the will of God, that is contrary to that which is fitting under the Lordship of Messiah, obviously she should refuse that. Now, I don't want to mention any names, but there was an individual who had a, a program, and, and he, he spoke about just absoluteness. Now, I'm a person that likes absoluteness, but we need to be absolutely correct. And he was saying here that in everything, you know, the husbands, he's responsible. Whatever he says to do, you just do it. That is false teaching. It says here, that which is appropriate, proper, fitting in the Lord. Not just to be submissive, but to be submissive in the things that are under the Lordship of Messiah. Likewise, he says, and husbands, love your wife. Now, that word love implies a surrender. It implies sacrifice. Why do I say that? Well, we all know the scripture from John, John chapter 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave. So husbands, give to your wife. Give generously of yourself. Invest yourself in them. That's what it's saying here. And these two things, her being submissive and you investing yourself in her, these two things work together to produce a godly family, a family that God will bless. But it's very important. He says here, husbands, love your wives. In another scripture in Ephesians, he says, love your wives just as Messiah loved the church. What did he do? Gave himself. So we need to be submissive. We need to put, and here's the key, we need to put our wives ahead of us. That's what we see biblically. So husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh. Do not, that word means make them bitter or embitter them. He says, do not do that. Next, he moves on to the children. And children, it's a different word. It's not submit, but it's the word obey. Now, that word obey really means listen to. And once again, it says, listen to the parents, according to all. Now, 
It goes, I believe, without saying that a child, well, when it says here, doesn't say, you know, it uses a term tekna, which is a child. Now, the reason for this is that a child or a young person, maybe 4, 6, 10, 12, 14, they don't have the wisdom, the intelligence to really question their parents. They need to obey them in all things. But obviously, when a, a child gets older, we would say from a Jewish cultural position at the age of bar mitzvah, we see that that, that boy becomes a man, meaning this. There's a prayer that says, the father says, I'm released from responsibility, meaning not that he doesn't have to care for that child, but if that child does something wrong, it's on him beginning at bar mitzvah age, rather than on the father. And once again, I think it's highly appropriate that a, a child, whether he is uh, bar mitzvah age or beyond, he needs to submit to his parents, obey his parents, but once more, in the Lord. If a father or a mother should tell that, that, that child of theirs that may be an adult, do this, don't do this, marry this, don't marry this, all of this. And that parents are not a believer or not walking in the Lord or doesn't understand spiritual truth. You can still honor your parents, but that doesn't mean that you're supposed to agree with sinful behavior. So it says, look again, verse, verse 20, second part. And children obey the parents according to all, for this is pleasing to the Lord. Verse 21, and fathers do not provoke your children. Now here again, the context is usually speaking about a smaller child than an adult child. And notice something else. We see how it speaks to husbands and wives, parents and children, and what he says to one then he comes back with and says something to the other. So he says, children, obey your parents in all things, for this is pleasing to the Lord. Then verse 21, and parents, do not provoke, don't incite your children. Why? In order that they do not despair or we might say lose heart. So parents are supposed to be an encouragement to the children. They are supposed to instruct them in a way that motivates them to do the right thing in the Lord. That's why we know each day in the morning and in the evening, if you come from a, a Jewish background, you say the Shema. That, that statement of faith, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And we talk about loving Him, obeying Him, doing His commandments, but when God gets specific, the first commandment that he mentions here is to teach your children diligently. And if you want to have children that are obedient, if you want to have children that don't lose heart, then teach them the word of God. So parents, do not provoke your children in order that they do not lose heart. Now we go to verse 22. And for the next part of, of, of this chapter, which concludes this chapter, he's going to be speaking about a relationship, one that may be somewhat foreign to us. Many times it talks about uh, masters and slaves or servants. Now, here's what we need to understand. It is very different than what we oftentimes think of today as slavery. This way, Mary will be speaking about a servant as an employee rather than a slave in, in that sense. Someone was bought and, and now purchased possession. See, Judaism wouldn't allow that. You say, well, they had bond servants. Yes, but they were for a purpose of in themselves, and that is to pay off a debt. It was limited to a specific period of time that could not be more than six years. And the seventh year, the servant didn't work, but he was provided for. 
or he was sent away with a year's salary to get him back on the street, in his, back on his feet. So it's very, very different. But regardless, if we just take this in the broadest way, realize what he's saying. Look at the text, verse 22. And servants obey according to all, to those according to the flesh who are masters. Now, this word is the word lords, and it speaks about one who has authority over you. Obviously, we're not using the sense of the Lord God Almighty, but someone who has authority over another person. And what he's saying here to one who is under the authority of another, that you are to submit to that authority. Here again, he says, in all things, but obviously not uh, forsaking scriptural truth. Once more, servants obey according to all things. Those according to the flesh are masters having authority and do not do so with eye service or as man pleasers but in the sincerity of the heart and fearing God now that's important see we need to underline that fearing God this is fearing God is putting God first so you do this with the fear of God doing so in a way that would be pleasing to him and even if you are a servant of someone, if they instruct you to do something that is against the priorities of God, one must not do that. I mean, that's just the character of so much scripture. We find that Daniel, he was submissive, but he wouldn't pray, stop praying to his God. We see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were submissive in nature. But they wouldn't bow down to that image. They would rather be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And the apostles, for example, Peter, when he was commanded by the authorities, do not speak in the name of Yeshua, he continued to do so. Why? Because ultimately, our obedience, our submissiveness is to God. So it says here, doing all things according to the fear of God. Verse 23. And all what someone should do, do it how? All whatever you should do, do it as, as work of the soul. Now, this means insincerity. It means to do so in a proper way. Realizing, notice what it says, as to the Lord and not to man. So this scripture makes it very clear that we should never lose sight of the fact that we are serving God. No matter where we are, whether we're in a marriage, whether we're in a home and we're dealing with our parents, whether we're parents dealing with our children, always we need to remember that God is the priority of our life. And we do everything out of fear of God in order that we are serving Him. So never in serving the Lord would we want to do something that's against his instruction. That's foundational in this. So doing all things, look at the scripture, verse, verse 23 at the end. As to the Lord and not to man, knowing that from the Lord you will receive a reward of the inheritance. Not just any inheritance, but it says here, the inheritance. A reward where, well, the inheritance that they're speaking of is one in the kingdom of God. So over and over, what Paul is saying is this. We need to live in light of the fact that there is a kingdom inheritance. And every decision we make, we need to make it realizing if we choose righteously, we choose in agreement with the truth of God. God, what does the scripture say in the book of Hebrews? He is not unjust to forget any of our good deeds. That's why there's those books that's going to be opened up. That's why when Messiah returns, it says, Behold, I am coming soon, and my reward is with me. To render to each man, each woman, according to his deeds.
And we need to remember that there is a day of judgment, not speaking simply about God's wrath falling, but rather judgment as the judgment of rewards. Now, here's the problem. In the same way that people so frequently forget about God's judgment, we don't hear too many messages about it, not too many books written in regard to it, and no conferences that I know of that focus on the judgment of God. But the judgment of God has two applications. One is indeed to condemn those who have rebelled against the gospel message. See, it's only the gospel that is going to cause you to live properly, live pleasing to God. And that should be the overwhelming purpose for receiving Messiah into your life, that you want to live pleasingly. Now, people say, well, I've accepted the gospel because I don't want to be punished for my sins. Absolutely. That is a great benefit. That is true. But if you only don't want to be punished for your sins and you have no thought of turning away from sin and embracing the will of God, in my opinion, you haven't accepted a biblical gospel. And so much of what is being presented as gospel preaching, evangelism, it distorts the truth of what we see mentioned in the scripture. You say, well, could you help me really understand that? Absolutely. Think about the Great Commission. I'm speaking of the last few verses of the book of Matthew, Matthew 28, beginning in verses 19 and 20. What does he say there? He says, go forth and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But you know what else is there? It says, teaching them to obey all which I commanded you. Now, he, when he sends people out to go and make disciples, obviously that has a gospel purpose. But realize this, that gospel purpose also has within it teaching people to observe all the things that, that God has commanded. And that's exactly what we're talking about here. So once more, look at the text. He says here, be individuals. No matter what you do, work sincerely as to the Lord, not to man. Knowing, verse 24, knowing that from the Lord you will receive a reward of the inheritance. For to Messiah, the Lord, you serve. Isn't that great? He constantly reminds us that the one that we're serving, he says, to the Lord Messiah, you are to serve. You need to think about whatever you're doing in your job, at home, to a parent, to your wife, that in actuality, you're serving the Lord. We were talking not too long ago at a conference that I was speaking at. We were speaking again as about the family, about marriage. And we talked about the truth that Marriage is a covenant, a covenant between a man and God and a woman and God. And as we draw closer to God, we draw closer in that marital relationship. And someone asked the question, well, what about if my spouse, and it was sad because this person was there without their spouse. Yes, my spouse, they said, is a believer, but, but, but he is not living for the Lord. He's not doing what we've just studied that a husband should do. So why should I also do my responsibility? Now, I think that's a very legitimate question, a very honest question, but it fails to understand the nature of a marriage. You see, a covenant marriage, just like it says here, you serve the Lord. You do what you're supposed to in a marriage unto the Lord. Why? Because if you become disobedient to your role as a wife or your role as a husband and the other one's doing the same, you know what that does? That kind of pushes God out of the marriage. But when one person's being faithful, you know what that does? It brings about godly activity. He goes to work. He sees your faithfulness, your commitment, 
your obedience to the role as a husband or a role as a wife. And he goes to work in bringing about change in that spouse that is rebellious. So that's why it's so important that we realize there is a reward for faithfulness, obedience, and that God, we need to see him as the one that we're serving. Well, drop down to verse 25, the last verse. He says, And the one who does unjustly, the one who does something that is not righteous, it says, he will be rewarded. That is, there's going to be a recompense. There's going to be a response for that which is done that's wrong. Also, he says, and speaking about God, God is not a respecter of people, meaning this, that God has no favorites. He does not show partiality. And I think it's so important that this whole chapter ends with that 21st, 5th verse. He says, the one that does evil, the one that acts improperly, the one that does not do righteousness, says there's going to be a result. There's going to be a response from God on that which is done, which is improper, which is unjust, which is unrighteous. God's faithful. And he ends by saying, it doesn't matter who you are. God's going to look and he's going to respond according to his truth. The question is this, are we truly believers in this book as the truth of God? That what God has said he's going to do, that he's going to re reward the faithful and he's going to punish the faithless. He is going to deal with those who are rebellious and he's going to reward greatly with his presence, with his power, with his intimacy, those who surrender to the truth of scripture. Our God is a faithful God, and let us approach him in faithfulness. Well, once again, I'm out of time until next week. May God bless you.